Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, this month's monthly uh, inference colloquium as part of our series on trying to understand the nature of correlation and causation. And it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our wonderful speaker for uh, the talk today, um, Dr. Eric Winsberg. But before I give you a brief introduction um, to his intellectual trajectory and his work, I would like to say thanks to our benefactors, Mr. and uh, Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, who uh, are unfortunately not joining us today, but um, their support of the Frankie program and many other activities at Yale is gratefully acknowledged. So I also want to remind all of you that um, we are recording this event and therefore all participants must therefore mute their videos. And as per usual and customary at the end of Eric's talk, we will um, uh, have uh, your questions, which you can feel free to type up in the chat um, as we go along and we'll have a Q and A session um, at, the, at the very end. So I also wanted to remind everyone that in addition to today's lecture, um, in, the, in this colloquium series, we have sort of the discussion session that happens tomorrow at the same time uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will have a discussion of uh, Eric Winsberg and the conversant this time is going to be Dr. Stephanie uh, Harvard, who works, uh, is a, re a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of British Columbia and uh, in the Faculty of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences. So uh, first, um, moving on to today's talk, um, I just wanted to give you a, a brief sense of um, Eric's intellectual path and his research interests. I first got to know of Eric uh, when I read his work on uh, simulations, um, really um, radical rethinking of how to understand simulations and modeling in the context of um, sciences and a range of sciences. So Eric got his PhD from Indiana and uh, following a postdoctoral fellowship in history and philosophy of science at Northwestern, he joined the philosophy department as a faculty member at, the, uh, at USF. And he joined, uh, he went there in 2001 and has remained there since. His principal interests are in the philosophy of science, uh, in particular, the philosophy of climate science and the philosophy of physics. He's uh, particularly interested in the role of computer simulations in physical sciences and analog simulation in cosmology and in the foundations of statistical physics and the direction of time. Many of you would have heard him. Uh, he was our conversant um, with Carlo Rovelli, uh, which was sort of the opening talk of our series. Um, his, um, he also writes on truth and on scientific authorship. It's a really wide ranging set of uh, interests. He's the author of several articles on all of these topics that are appeared in all the top journals like Philosophy of Science, Journal of Philosophy, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, Studies in the History and Philosophy of Modern Physics and Synthes. He has held a numerous uh, visiting fellowships um, and has a lot of um, honors, uh, was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Durham in the UK, at the University of California, Berkeley, at MCMP in Munich, and the University of Lundberg in Germany. So he has two wonderful books, um, which are out already. Uh, the first one is Science in the Age of Computer Simulation from the University of Chicago Press and uh, Philosophy and Climate, um, and Climate Science, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press. And he has a forthcoming book, Cambridge Elements in Philosophy of Science on Models in Science. Over the last year, um, during the pandemic, um, Eric has focused on the use of models and methods of causal inference in the COVID-19 pandemic. Extremely important work, as many of you know that during the pandemic, we really saw the provisional nature of science 
and how we can draw limited inferences as we get to know more and more about the disease. We saw all of that play out right in front of our eyes. We all had front row seats to how this was happening. So we really look forward to hearing, Eric, some of your thoughts on, um, on this, and hopefully uh, you will come, um, cover some of this material today. Uh, um, so when he's not uh, tapping away on his laptop working, um, working, you can often find him on the water in his stand-up paddleboard. Oh, that is the joy of people who live in lovely climates. What can I say? Very envious, Eric. So um, the title of his talk today is Causal Inference in Complex Nonlinear Systems, A Cautionary Tale. So thank you so much, Eric, for agreeing to speak in this series. And we are absolutely delighted. And uh, take it away, please. Thank you, Priya. Let me see if I can get this. Okay, great. So just to give people a little bit of background, and Priya has already told you that I've worked a lot on uh, philosophy of climate science. I, I finished my book up on uh, philosophy of climate science in about 2017. And uh, I was going out to California, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. And I wanted to start thinking a little bit more about uh, how modeling ought to inform policy, because I've really been focusing mostly just on the mod modeling itself. And I sort of started to make a transition to thinking more about having a more sort of policy oriented focus to my research. Um, and that was in you know, January of 2020. Um, and then we all know what happened uh, in the next couple of months, um, which made it pretty, you know, pretty obvious to me that I ought to be uh, focusing on uh, this you know, very new area in which models were uh, informing policy in a pretty you know, quick and, 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 and uh, impactful sort of way. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I, I, I hope we, we can sort of get around to uh, in this session is think is talking about what kinds of uh, what kinds of ways modeling ought to inform policy, what constraints there ought to be on models that inform policy, that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, because uh, because of the sort of theme of the conference, I wanted to just focus a lot on uh, you know the theme of, the conf of this of this series being um, the relationship between correlation and causation. I wanted to focus on some of the stuff I've been watching uh, about how we've made causal inferences over the course of the pandemic. And then I'm hoping like tomorrow, um, as Stephanie joins the conversation, we can kind of broaden the conversation back to the general topic of how models ought to inform policy. Okay, so let's see, how does this, here we go. So um, a lot of this kind of started uh, when um, early, you know, my interest in this kind of started early in the pandemic, and I had to go back to the Wayback Machine on the internet to find this, because I unfortunately didn't screenshot it at the time. But this was, um, you know, the Financial Times, circa March 29th, I think it is, 2020, um, showing us the course of the pandemic uh, in a variety of countries. And one of the things I found fascinating about this chart was all these little, um, all these little uh, blurbs that get inserted here, sort of explaining uh, the course of the pandemic in all these countries. So Italy had the highest death rate because of a large elderly population. South Korea had a low death rate because of early large scale testing and tracing. Um, Spain uh, locked down after 200 days, but France locked down after 175 days. And that's why Spain is a little bit ahead of France. Uh, Japan, I had to write this one in myself because I, I, I definitely remember this being on here, but I didn't find the version that said it. Japan had a culture of masks and bowing, and that was you know, responsible for uh, where they are on the chart. Um, and a lot of what this re immediately reminded me of was uh, a, a, an episode in the history of, uh, of climate science, which kind of lasted from about 1998 till 2012. Uh, and it was, known as the, it was known as the warming hiatus. Uh, and there was, a lot of, there was a lot of ink spilled over this hiatus that was thought to have been happening between 1998 and 2012. And you can kind of see it here, right? Um, so the green line is uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which you know, all climate scientists uh, agree results in, in warming of the planet. And yet this, this red line here, which was tracing out uh, the global average surface temperature of the planet, uh, seemed to hit kind of uh, a slow patch in about 1998. As you can see in the chart, between about 1998 and 2012, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, net warming of the planet. Uh, and this caused a lot of consternation uh, among a variety of parties. And people immediately wanted to know why. 
why is there this hiatus? Uh, and uh, of course, people who were uh, opponents of uh, climate mitigation, uh, who were doubters of the existence of climate change, uh, declared it to be a major problem, right? Uh, so this is the Telegraph in 2006. There is a problem with global warming um, and that it stopped in 1998. Um, and immediately, I think uh, climate scientists felt the need to explain this. Why? Why did, the, why did the warming stop in 1998? And there were, I think, sort of two causal questions here, two explanations. One was um, why, why, the, why the slowdown, right? So just the brute fact that the warming of the planet seemed to have paused, maybe. Uh, so just the brute fact itself. Um, and then there was this, what was perceived to be this modeling mismatch, right? So if you look in this, if you look in this picture, um, what you see, the, the kind of grayish black line here, that's kind of heading inexorably upward. Um, that was the predictions of the, the so-called the CMIP, the Climate Model Interpreparison Project, which kind of averages together uh, the forecasts of a variety of plant models. And then all these little colored lines, which were the actual um, data sets of various uh, meteorological and climate uh, agencies around the world like the Hadley Center in the UK and the National Atmosphere and Ocean uh, Association in the United States. So, um, so, you know, there was this brute fact, uh, warming seems to have paused, and then this modeling mismatch. And the question was why? Um, and there were, you know, sort of a, a variety of, of explanations. Uh, this is from a paper in 2015 uh, by, by Thorne uh, and others, kind of going through a variety of, 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 of plausible explanations of why the pause happened. You know, maybe it was variations in El Nino, uh, maybe it was some volcanic eruptions, maybe it was a quiet solar cycle, maybe it was changes in stratospheric water vapor. So, you know, climate scientists, I think, felt the pressure to explain this pause, uh, came up with a variety of explanations. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, um, the other side said, oh, you know, they're just, we'll get all these excuses, right? So this is this kind of uh, notorious um, climate skeptic uh, blog. What's up with that? Uh, and you know, uh, here you get from 2014 a list of excuses for uh, for the pause. Of course, um, you know, uh, in the end, uh, I need to sort of drag my window here so I can see this. In the end, right, if, as we look at this, you know, running all the way from let's say about 1900 up to the present. Um, you can still see this little pause here between about 1998 and about 2012. But in the great scheme of things, right, um, it's pretty clear that nothing particularly interesting or important was, ap was happening here. There was, you know, just maybe a little bit of internal variability uh, swamping the overall trend. So the, the clear trend here from 1900 to about 2020 uh, is warming. And you just get, right, you get in this about 14 year period for whatever reason, uh, you get some internal variability in the climate that is that is swamping swamping the trend, um, and and then you know also I think one of the other things that people sort of overlooked in uh, if we go back and we look at this picture, right? Why why is there uh, why is there this sort of pause in the data, but this very smooth increase in the predictions of the models? Why don't the models also predict this kind of internal variability? You might ask, um, and the answer there I think is also rather simple. Uh, the CMEP is a, is a, it, it's a, it's a climate model intercomparison project. So it's, a, it's an amalgam of, uh, you know, it averages over a, a variety of different climate models. Um, and that's just apt to smooth out. Uh, that's just apt to smooth out. Each model had, you know, probably had a similar amount of internal variability as the actual uh, data did. But when you average them together, uh, you got something that looked quite a bit smoother. Okay, so, um, so there was a rather simple answer to the question, um, why was there a, a, a warming hiatus? Um, and, the, and, and the real answer was, well, it's a complex nonlinear system and complex nonlinear systems just do weird things. They, they behave in kind of, um, you know, uh, sporadic and jumpy and clumpy ways. Um, and there's a danger, right? I think when you see the behavior of nonlinear systems, this is gonna be a, one of my main themes today, there's a danger when you see the erratic behavior of a nonlinear system to think there must be an explanation for these things. And I think we saw that happen quite, quite a bit um, in that period of, uh, uh, of climate history 
when there was this, um, when there was this. And so when I, when I saw, started seeing these pictures in, uh, in the Financial Times with all these explanations of each one of these, each one of these uh, graphs, um, uh, it you know, sort of set my alarm bells off. Um, maybe something similar is going on here. Um, and, and another sort of, I think, you know, uh, thing that we saw in the, in the climate hiatus case is that data are always uncertain, right? Data are always uncertain. And one of the things that's, one of the things that, you know, drives all of the, uh, the mystery in this chart, right? Uh, is that supposedly, uh, sorry, supposedly all of these, all of these graphs supposedly are, are um, synchronized uh, beginning when um, the number of deaths in that country reached 10, right? But, but we, now, we now know, I think in retrospect, that this was all a fantasy, right? Um, we had no idea when each of these countries reached their 10th death. Um, there was a nice recent, really careful recent paper um, that uh, in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, I think it was, that um, I did, did so many people have been doing now for months, but did it very carefully. And showed that you know by January, by, the, by sort of middle of January 2020, there were already cases of uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 infection in uh, six or seven. I can't remember if it was six or seven U.S. states. So they just went and looked at um, you know uh, blood blood donors from that period. So you know we we really don't know. We really don't know when any of these countries had their tenth death. Um, and so all of this lining up and all of this like that was all relatively um, just. Uh, you know, uh, an artifact of the way that the data was being collected at the time. We really don't know how to line up these different countries with respect to when they, when their, when their epidemic started. Um, and and sort of over the course of the pandemic, we've been, you know, we've been subjected to um, a lot of causal inferences. Um, and uh, I think one of the other things that happens when you have a lot of noisy data with a lot of uh, clumpy, perky, jerky behavior in it, um, people will often find what they want to find. Just as in the, in, in the, in the climate case, people who didn't believe in climate change uh, took that as an opportunity to say that they, they were finding this. So I think in, in the pandemic, um, people have been able to find what they want to find. So here's, a, you know, here's a, um, uh, an article that ran in a, a bunch of news outlets. I think the Associated Press started this. It's from right after the election, obviously November 6th, 2020. Um, and it tells us that US counties with the highest fire surges um, overwhelmingly voted for Trump. Um, and you know, when this came out, my first thought was, oh, okay, well, you know, then maybe that's just kind of, um, uh, again, just some kind of spurious correlation here. Uh, maybe there's something to this. But then of course, once you dug into the data a little bit, what you realized was that um, it's true that uh, the U.S. counties with the highest virus surges overwhelmingly voted for Trump, but it's also true that the counties with the lowest virus surges overwhelmingly voted for Trump. Um, and there's a simple explanation for this, and that's that uh, uh, the counties that voted for Trump were on on the were on the whole smaller counties than the counties that voted for Biden. So we know that we well, obviously we all know that. Um, rural America uh, tended to vote more for Trump and urban America voted for Biden. Rural counties are smaller, small samples have more variance. Um, and so small samples tended to have, the, the, the Trump counties tended to have either very large numbers of coronavirus or very low numbers of coronavirus. They just had, right, they just had the, the noisier samples in them. Um, that was primarily what was going on here. Um, and then we also, you know, very, very, well, soon we were looking at people were trying to find evidence of that various you know public health measures of various kinds uh, were effective. Um, so we're very it, it, not people remember this right, but we very sort of, very quickly went from um, uh, a pretty broad consensus in uh, say February March of 2020 among public health experts that um, that masks were not really something that the public ought to be concerned about. Um, and then quickly, you know, quickly that that scientific consensus changed, and so there was there was a lot of work trying to trying to show this, um, and uh, um, you know, a lot of it really kind of was uh, pretty quick and dirty. Uh, so uh, this was a study that came out in um, uh, so it was, it was published in October of 2020. 
not reported in a lot of outlets. This is a CNN article that's, that's referring back to the study. Um, and and what, what, did, what was the study doing? The study was merely going back to um, uh, kind of late April, early May uh, in the pandemic. And it was uh, sort of linearly extrapolating um, these curves, right? Well, linearly in the log scale, right? So in other words, sort of exponentially extra extrapolating them and then just sort of trying to say, okay, well, what is, what's the thing that happened right before some of these curves are turning down? Oh, lo and behold, right? Um, lo and behold, it's, it's masks. So not really, the, not really um, a, a, a super um, rigorous way of establishing causal hypotheses. Um, you know, we, uh, we and, and you saw, lot, saw lots of studies like this where this was really the method that was being used. You would just get, somebody would, would kind of take a particular place. In this case, it was the Delaware, it was the Delaware Department of Health's data um, on, uh, uh, on uh, infections in Delaware and people just sort of putting the, you know, putting what they took to be the dates on which some of these public health interventions happened and then trying to line them up with bumps in the curve. Whereas you can know, pretty clearly see that, that you've got just kind of a, a fairly noisy and bumpy curve here. Um, and then just sort of trying to, trying to draw um, uh, causal uh, hypotheses out of this. Um, and you know, this was kind of, I, this was something that I, um, that I posted um, on Facebook just to, to make fun of this, right? But, um, so I'd been in California, right? Until on June 15th, we came back from California we returned to Florida, um, and this was, you know, a chart of uh, uh, the hospitalizations in Florida. And of course, right, it's very easy to just say, "Oh, okay, look here, here's when, here's when Eric returned to Florida, and look what, you know, look what happened to hospitalizations in, in Florida right after that." Um, but of course, that's not a particularly uh, effective way of drawing uh, causal inferences. Um, and you know, we were also then. I think we we saw a lot of things like this happen. Uh, so this was a Scientific American ran this story in September 15, 2020, um, how New Mexico controlled the spread of COVID-19. So we were very eager, right, to go find places where it looked like um, there was success in mitigating the epidemic, try to figure out what, what did those places do um, and say, oh, okay, that, that must be, you know, the fact that New Mexico has controlled the spread, they must have a secret sauce. For uh, for making this uh, for making this work, and of course, this was one of the most um, ill-timed uh, articles of the pandemic. Uh, you can see it here in a chart of uh, 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 the case rate in New Mexico, right? So um, here's the the article comes out on September 15th: how New Mexico controlled the spread of COVID-19, and then there's the uh, there's what happened just a couple of weeks later. Um, Similar kind of uh, similar kind of event here, right? Um, here we have this is a, a an article that ran in um, in Germany. Uh, you know, is Hamburg proof that an emergency break can get COVID nineteen cases down? Uh, so they were trying. People thought, okay, look, Hamburg is doing really well. They must be must be establishing something. Must have some effective method of doing this. Um, but of course, a couple of things, right? Um, as with many of these things, this was just, you know, always these things tend to come out right before things would get bad, but sort of also interestingly, right, it's, it's interesting, I think, to line up um, the, uh, this is, you know, ICU utilization for COVID-19 patients per million population, comparing um, the, the Hamburg uh, sort of administrative region, what they call the Bundesland, and the, the Stockholm, the, I guess the sort of Stockholm County, Stockholm lands. Um, and you can see, right, that um, pretty clearly whatever is going on uh, in these places uh, is something is something fairly regional, right? And so um, any attempt to kind of, you know, look for the interventions that Hamburg was carrying out at these various places, closing uh, restaurants, having mask mandates, closing shops, uh, making uh, masks uh, required in private cars, having curfews, et cetera. And you can sort of see, right, people are going through this and attributing these various zigs and zags in the graph to all these things. But, you know, we know, right, that um, we know that Stockholm was not doing these things. Um, and given that Stockholm and Hamburg are kind of 
proximal to each other, have similar climate, uh, are sort of under whatever whatever makes these uh, whatever makes these curves come and go. Plausibly, we're you know being affected by them um, in relatively similar ways. Uh, we can see right that um, it, it, you know this is of course I, I don't want to suggest that I, I can make better inferences myself, but it does seem it does seem sort of uh, at least prima facie plausible that these these attributions of the of the various zigs and zags and curve to these interventions is is, is spurious here. Uh, we also you know saw lots of um, we saw lots of cases like this. This was a a, a, a very widely cited um, and influential study by uh, so Monica Gandhi here is the uh, the last author on this, but I suspect probably the one of the the uh, that's one of his last authors who's really the main author. Uh, she was a, a, a major, um, you know, uh, uh, leader in, 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 in providing evidence for the effectiveness of mask mandates. Uh, so this was a, a paper that, uh, that came, that uh, posted on November 4th. Um, and uh, the paper was withdrawn. Uh, I forget exactly what the timeline between the publication and withdrawal was, but uh, they withdrew it for, they say here the authors have withdrawn this manuscript because there are increased cases of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the areas we originally analyzed in the study. So, you know, here they were, they, they'd taken some places where there were mask mandates, some places where there were not mask mandates. They had used various statistical methods to show that uh, the case rates had grown in the places where there weren't mask mates and, and hadn't in the places where there were. But then, of course, you know, within, within a month or two, um, they had to withdraw the paper because uh, many of the places that they were claiming had been uh, you know, saved by the mask mandates, we're, we're just catching up with the places that didn't have the mask mandates uh, a little while later. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, one of the things I, I want to talk about especially is, uh, this, was a, this was a paper that came out um, uh, in December 2020, but I believe appeared uh, on, the, on a, you know, in a, pre, in a preprint form a, a couple or maybe three months earlier. Um, that uh, used a method called um, uh, synthetic controls that I want to talk about a little bit today uh, to show that face masks uh, had considerably reduced COVID-19 cases in, in the parts of Germany that had instituted mask mandates. Um, and I think, again, that, sort of, that evidence kind of seemed to evaporate uh, over time. Um, but this was, this was I, I want to talk about this a little bit because a lot as sort of, uh, you know, early on, right, we were seeing like, you know, the Financial Times thing where just really sort of crude causal attributions, you know, oh, here, look, here's a chart. This is because of, you know, this is because of a culture of bowing or whatever, sort of really, um, uh, you know, very fast and loose inferences like that. Over time, this, this method of synthetic controls became sort of really uh, became um, quite prominent in trying to be more careful uh, in establishing these things. Um, so in that paper by this group, right, you find this, this quite, you know, strong sentence, which has a detailed analysis of the timing of all public health measures in the region. We studied guarantees that we correctly attribute our findings to face masks um, and not erroneously to other public health measures. So I, I'm going to get to this in a bit, but I want to talk a little about this synthetic control method um, and maybe suggest reasons why um, it's not quite the magic bullet that many of the people were trying to use it over the last year claimed it was. Um, this is just another one. This was another sort of famous uh, pretty widely shared headline that this was based on a study that used the synthetic control method uh, that tried to show that the Sturgis motorcycle rally, uh, which happened in South Dakota in uh, June, I guess, uh, was responsible for, maybe May, was responsible for uh, a large amount of the spread. Because you may remember that uh, the upper Midwest kind of had its big wave uh, right around the time of this motorcycle rally. So, um, Okay, so um, I just want to step back a little bit uh, and talk about um, nonlinear phenomena and why, or you know, just sort of illustrate that nonlinear phenomena tend to have interesting patterns that don't really call for explanation. So um, here's a, a this is maybe one of the most classic examples of a nonlinear phenomenon. This is a double pendulum, right? It's a it's a pendulum on the end of a pendulum, and when you watch something like this swing, you can just see, right, that it it just goes through these moments where it kind of spins wildly 
and then kind of slows down a bit, and then we'll swing lively later. I mean, anybody who watched something like this and thought, oh, I want to, I want to try to explain why is why at you know time at eight seconds into it did it start spinning furiously, and then 12 seconds into it stop spinning furiously. Um, you could, you know, if you had, if you, if you had a, a wild imagination, right? You could imagine coming up with all kinds of explanations uh, for why this kind of thing is happening. But um, it's just, it's just, it's, it's the nature of the double pendulum, right? And it's part of the nature of it being a nonlinear system uh, that it just exhibits these uh, quite uh, interesting sporadic things. And here's just, a, this is actually a simulation just because um, uh, fluids are a little harder to visualize than pendulums, but you can see this in real data too. This is so-called Raleigh Bernard convection, Bernard convection, uh, where you have a hot plate on the bottom and a cold plate on the top of some fluid. Um, and pretty quickly, right, you can see that all kinds of interesting um, patterns start to form. Uh, and, and anybody who uh, was not familiar with what was going on here uh, and wanted to then explain why is there a you know, dark red patch here and a dark blue patch here and you know why does this thing have uh, why is this thing displaying all the patterns that it is uh you can kind of give a global account of why it has the sort of general you know why why does it have why does it have a generally sort of you know eddy-ish structure but if you tried to explain you know why is why is there a big red eddy here and a big blue eddy over there um you'd be you'd be pretty quickly getting yourself into uh into trouble here Okay, so just just uh, you know a few things uh, I think worth noting about nonlinear systems, right? Um, that we just we just know this from from the study of a wide variety of systems. They can display abrupt transmit. They they can display abrupt transitions in responses to small changes, right? So if if um, if you had you know two uh, fluids next to each other, one that was exhibiting shallow convection and one that was ex exhibiting deep convection. Uh, an inexperienced observer might think there was some deep substantial cause or factor for, responsible for that difference, right? They would look at these two convective systems and say, look, they look radically different. There must be some, there must be some explanation for why this one's undergoing deep convection and that one is going shallow, undergoing shallow convection. But um, the only explanation that there would be would be uh, a very microscopic and very un cognitively unsatisfying one. It would be if you could, in fact, if you, you know, if you were, really had an unbelievably detailed modular system, you might be able to track it down to some very small difference uh, and identify what that small difference was, right? It wouldn't be due to nothing, um, but it wouldn't be the kind of thing that somebody who was inexperienced and he was looking for, um, who was looking for uh, something like that. Uh, so similarly, right, we know that avalanches, um, we, we know that avalanches can be caused if you have a pile of sand, right? One very, you know, ill-placed grain uh, added to an otherwise stable pile can, can cause a massive avalanche. Perhaps more relevant to pandemics, right? Uh, we know that if you have a, like a lattice of nodes um, and you, you just assign random connections between those nodes, and then you look at whether there's a, you know, how many paths there are from the top to the bottom, very, a very tiny change in the probability of connections, right, can sort of massively give sort of big qualitative changes to what to the number of paths that you'll find between top and bottom. So a lot of times the sort of take home lesson here, right, is that a lot of times um, these kinds of behavioral changes that you see in nonlinear phenomena cry out for explanation, um, even though uh, the true explanation is often microscopic, um, nearly impossible to identify. And I think really, you know, not just, I want to say cognitively unsatisfying, just in the sense that it's not the it's not the kind of thing that uh, as human beings, we, when we encounter these kind of phenomena, it's not the kind of thing that we typically are inclined to attribute uh, the, the explanation to. Um, uh, it's just a picture of, uh, of Jupiter here, right? With its famous red spot, which is just another one of these sort of coherent structures that emerges uh, out of a nonlinear system that if you wanted to know, if you lived on Jupiter and you wanted to know why is there, a, why is the red spot here? Um, you would not get a very cognitively satisfying answer. Okay, so so one of the main take-home lessons here of the talk um, is uh, um, when you have these three things together, right? A non, uh, you know, a, a system that exhibits a fair degree of nonlinearity, 
a sort of rich causal menu available to you, right? Think of the think of the original um, the little Financial Times chart. You know uh, who locked down when? Who has a culture of mask wearing and bowing? Who had an elderly population? Who was using test and trace? Who was doing? So you have a sort of rich causal menu that you can appeal to, right? Um, and right uh, something that you know I think this is a uh, uh, famous anthropologist uh, Evans Pritchard noted this when he was studying the, the Azande in Africa, right? That it's a pretty common feature of human beings that when people get sick or when bad things happen to people, they immediately are looking for explanations in the form of why here, why now, why is this happening to me? Why is it happening here, not there? Um, what's going on? Uh, I think when you get these three things together, right? Nonlinearity, a rich causal menu that you can appeal to to explain those things, um, and a, des and a desire, right? A sort of urgent desire to know why is the pandemic bad here, but not there? Why is it happening to us, but not them? Why, why were they saved and we're not? Um, I think these three things together often lead to, um, to dangerous inferences. Um, and just, just to give you a little taste of this, this was kind of, as I started thinking about this, I was like, there's gotta be a really good, there's gotta be a really good example of this uh, from the history of science. And, um, the thing that occurred to me as I was thinking about different nonlinear systems, uh, earthquakes, right? Of course, um, the results of nonlinear phenomena. And there was a whole industry in the sort of late, mid to late 19th century of trying to understand what caused earthquakes, right? Again, because earthquakes were displaying exactly this kind of clumpy uh, nonlinear based kind of dispersion of, of, uh, of data. So you get people, you know, you get all these people in the late 19th century arguing about, is it due to atmospheric pressure? Is it due to uh, the seasons? Is it due to the position of the moon? Is it due to the position of the sun? Um, and, and much like, I think much like many of these things, not only do you in these cases have this kind of rich data with, uh, you know, all kinds of, you have a large causal menu, right? You these people are like looking at what, they want to know what causes earthquakes and they immediately imagine these are the things that might be causally responsible, right? They're not, they're plausible. Atmosphere pressure, position of the moon, position of the sun, tides, things like that. They have, you know, this messy, clumpy data. And then of course, what we, what we now know too is that their data were bad. They had, they didn't have, first of all, they didn't know, as we now know, that most of the earthquakes on the planet happen underneath the oceans. So they were missing, you know, at least 70% of the earthquakes. Um, and they're, 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 you get a lot of, you know, you get a lot of disagreement between these scientists that all boils down to they're looking at different data, right? So you have one, one person saying, oh, you know, it's clearly, it's clearly the position of the moon. And then someone else using their data saying, no, look, I can clearly show that there's no relationship between, uh, between the moon and, uh, and, uh, and, and earthquakes. Right. Okay. But, but these were, these were 19th century rubes, right? Um, we have, uh, we have much better data than they had. We had much better, um, methods of inference than they do, right? Surely we can do better. Um, uh, and, uh, surely we can, surely we can identify the causes of differential outcomes in the pandemic. Um, well, it's so a number of things I think are confounded here. So I just want to show you, a, a, this is a nice little picture that I like. This is based on, uh, so Oxford uh, has been running this um, uh, since uh, pretty early in the pandemic. They've been tracking what they call the stringency index uh, for, for different places. That's meant to be a sort of one number summary of how aggressive public health measures have been in various places in trying to control uh, the pandemic. Um, and you can plot them here for at least the, the, the US states um, so, you know, here you have, uh, here on the, on the horizontal axis, you have this Oxford stringency index um, from March, uh, averaged over March 2020 to May 2021. Uh, here you have uh, COVID-19 deaths per 100,000. Uh, the size of the blob is the, is the sort of, you know, so California is the biggest blob. Texas is nice and big. Hawaii is a tiny little dot, right? Uh, the red states are red, the blue states are blue. The purple states are purple. We all know what that means. Um, and you know, if, if you look at this, at least to the naked eye, it looks like mm, maybe there maybe there's some interesting patterns here. Maybe there's maybe there's some uh, maybe there's some uh, degree of covariance here, but it's not entirely obvious. 
Um, but what's interesting, right, is uh, the various ways that people can kind of uh, cherry pick uh, examples and make the cherry picking look plausible. So this is, I think you saw a number of, like, a lot, we heard a lot about this, about, about people argued about Sweden a lot over the course of the pandemic. And the argument was always, right, well, what's the relevant comparator for Sweden? Is it the European average or is it, you know, it's Scandinavian peers? And, and just sort of how you, how, how you decide that question is going to determine what you think the lesson of Sweden is. If you think the relevant comparator for Sweden is it's Scandinavian peers, well, then it looks like Sweden was a disaster relative to its peers. If you think Sweden's comparator ought to be uh, Euro European Union as a whole, Sweden's kind of in the middle of the pack, uh, despite having not really, um, you know, Sweden would be, uh, would be very low on this string of the index. I, I forget what, I should have looked up what their, what their actual value was on the Oxford scale. My guess is it's, you know, uh, it's down here somewhere near like Missouri or something like that. Um, but, but okay, but then here's what's interesting, right? If you kind of play this game of, right, thinking that you know what the relevant peer comparators are, you can show all kinds of interesting things. So if you pick um, North Dakota and South Dakota, well, surely those are good comparators. Okay, well, they don't really have a very different stringency index, but to the extent that they do, it looks like stringency led to more deaths. Um, maybe you think, okay, what about, you know, the Pacific Northwest? How about Oregon and Washington? Again, you can, you can find the opposite of what you would think is, is the prima facie uh, thing to expect. Um, you can pick Alabama, Mississippi, right? Pretty clear, those are peers, right? So I just, the point here is like, you see a lot of this, I think people play a lot of this game of like, oh, well, we can figure out what the, we can figure out what the relevant peers here are. Um, and in the process of that, we can uh, make this, but that's, a, I just, again, this is just kind of a cautionary, you know, this is a kind of dangerous game, right? Um, if you don't know, uh, if you don't know how much people are sort of loading the dice when they choose these comparators, um, people are liable to be able to demonstrate anything, anything they want uh, with, with, with comparisons like that. Okay, um, so what are, the, what, just, uh, what are the sort of most sophisticated methods that we've had available to us um, over the course of the pandemic for identifying um, what are the sort of causal determinants of, of different outcomes that we've seen around the world? Um, I sort of think they're sort of put them into two categories, right? We've had sort of sophisticated statistical methods, um, and then we've, we've seen some various attempts to use modeling, right? To use kind of some things like the Imperial College model that were originally intended to forecast what the, what the pandemic would do, um, being used retrospectively to explain why they, uh, why they did the things that they did. Okay, so statistical methods, right? Um, uh, here's the game, right? You want to know. You want to know. Did an intervention have some out, have, have some causal outcome, right? So you know, imagine you uh, you want to know. You know, when kids go to private school, are they better at math? The kids who go to private school do better on math tests. Okay. So the, what's the simplest thing you could do? You could look at kids who go to private school and kids who don't go to private school and see whether the kids in private school do better at math. But obviously, right? What would you find? You'd probably find, oh yeah, the kids in private school do better. But right. It would be because those kids are wealthy and wealthy kids on average, right, tend to have a lot more uh, other right, educational opportunities and they tend to have a lack of things that, you know, inhibit their educational growth, like not having a healthy breakfast or, you know, having, uh, you know, well, at the obvious point, right, that there are lots of, there are lots of things that could cause wealth to lead to better, better math scores. Okay. So, um, so obviously, right, you can't just look at whether kids in private schools are doing be do better than kids in public schools. Well, what you'd ideally like to do is, right, take a whole bunch of kids and randomly assign them to private school and public school, uh, but you can't do that, okay? Can't do that. I mean, well, you could do that maybe, but nobody's, nobody's, do nobody's done this. Probably a lot of people would uh, raise ethical flags if you tried to do this. So what you can hope to do is you can sort of hope to wait for natural experiments, so maybe, right, maybe you can wait until, I don't know, Cleveland one day, right, decides it's going to, it, it needs to do asbestos remediation in all its public schools. And so it hands out vouchers to all the kids to go to private school. Then you can maybe look and see, right, you can look and see, well, did the kids who got vouchers in Cleveland, did their math scores suddenly go up? Okay. Well, that would probably be pretty effective, but you can imagine somebody having to worry, right? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it just so happened that at the time that these vouchers were getting, being given out, right? Maybe it just so happened that 
um, everybody was getting better at math. Maybe, maybe there was like, that was the exact time when the Schoolhouse Rock episode came on TV that was making everybody better at math all at the same time, right? So how do we know that it's the, it's the vouchers and the kids going to private school that are doing it? Well, here's ideally what you'd love to do, right? You'd love to be able to say, okay, let's look at the county. I think it's Cuyahoga, do I have that? I'm, I can never pronounce that right. Cuyahoga County, which is where uh, Cleveland is in, right? Probably botching that. Um, and uh, maybe hopefully you could look at when the vouchers get handed out, right? Uh, to the private school kid, to the public school kids in Cleveland, right? You could compare, you don't, not just look at whether they're doing better at math, but you could, you could look at how much better they're doing at math compared to how the kids are doing in the suburbs of Cleveland. So the hope would be there, right? If, if it's not the vouchers that are making the kids do better at math, but it's some like underlying trend in the data, right? By comparing how much better they're doing in Cleveland than, than they are doing in the suburbs, you'd be teasing out, right? You'd be teasing out uh, exactly what the contribution of the going to private school is. Um, and this is what's known as the difference in difference method, right? Both, both Cleveland and its suburbs have some non-stationary data. It's changing over time. There's some difference, but you're looking for the difference in that difference. You're looking for how much did the, right, the Cleveland math scores change relative to what the overall trend was in the county as a whole. But, but right, what crucially this requires, what this requires is that overall you have what's known as the par sorry, what's, what's, what overall you have what's known as the parallel trends assumption. Okay? It requires that, that whatever is going on in Cleveland and its suburbs is the same except for, except for the introduction of the, uh, you know, the vouchers to go to the private school. Okay, um, synthetic control methods are not really that interestingly different from difference and difference methods. Okay. They, it, 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 when you first read about it, you think, well, this is like this sort of magic bullet that enables us to do, uh, right, um, what, what might be harder, because sometimes, right, it's hard to find, right, it's hard to find comparators there where parallel trends are in place. So what, what synthetic control method does is rather than comparing, right, the place where the intervention happens, right, to some particular comparator, you use sort of something like machine learning to build a synthetic comparator. So here, just this is a nice little example, right? Um, here's this place, Salta, that's in introducing a new uh, tourism policy. It's trying to determine whether that tourism policy is leading to increased employment in the tourism sector, okay? And all these little groups, so here's the, here's the, uh, here's when the, here's when the intervention happens on the dotted line, right? Here's uh, the black line is Salta's tourism employment level. And this, these gray lines, right? These gray lines are just a whole set of comparable, of comparable places uh, that didn't have a change in their tourism policy. And what you do is you kind of, you try to find, right? A way, you try to find a, a subset of those, talking about a subset of these places and a weighting for them that produces this synthetic comparator here. And that's what this little dotted line is, right? And then the hope is that this little dotted line will be very close to what Salta was like prior to the intervention. And then if that's the case, maybe you can, you can attribute whatever difference happens, sorry, whatever ah, difference happens afterward as, uh, being attributable to the tourism policy. Okay. But crucially, right, crucially, the parallel trends uh, still need to be in place, okay? Parallel trends still need to be in place. It's still, it, it's, you, you've, 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 you've been able to, to make yourself a synthetic control that, that looks a lot like the, your, your, your target area prior to the intervention, but in a way, the synthetic control method um, enables you to hide differences that, that, there, that were there that, that looked like you try to get almost a perfect match, right? But that might be just because the machine learning method is a really good way of data mining for a perfect match, even in, in, spite, of, um, in spite of an absence of parallel trends. Okay, so um, this is a this is nice paper uh, that was written 
right before the pandemic started uh, by one of the uh, one of the developers of the synthetic control method. I just want to read you a couple of uh, passages from it. Right? He says, synthetic controls provide many practical advantages for the estimation of effects of policy interventions and other events of interest. However, like any other statistical procedure, and especially for those aimed at estimating causal effects, the credibility of the results depends crucially on the level of diligence exerted in the application on the method and on whether contextual and data requirements are met in the empirical application hand. Okay. And this article emphasized the notion that mechanical applications of synthetic controls that do not take into account the context of the investigation or the nature of the data are risky enterprises. And Abadie in particular identifies two, uh, two um, sort of crucial desiderata that need to be in place for the synthetic control method to work, right? On the one hand, it's advisable uh, to select for the donor pool, right? That's the, the bunch of places you're gonna machine learn uh, uh, a synthetic control out of, uh, affected by the same regional economic shocks, he's an economist, as the unit where the intervention happens. On the other hand, if spillover effects are substantial and affect units in close geographical proximity, those units may provide a biased estimate of the counterfactual outcome without intervention for the unit affected by uh, the intervention, right? So think of it this way, right? You want to know, let's say, um, Jena, right? This, this was the, the mask study in Germany that used synthetic controls. Looked at Jena as a place where this mask mandate was introduced. You want to know whether the mask mandate led people to, uh, led, led cases to go down, okay? But you're worried about the following thing, right? It's plausible that when Yena introduces mask mandates, places around in the proximity of Yena, people will start wearing masks because they see, you know, their, their close relatives live in Yena, they have friends in Yena, uh, they commute to Yena, and some of them come back. And so they, you get the spillover effect of mask wearing, right, in the regions surrounding Yena. Um, at the same time, right, you want to make sure that you are, right, um, sampling from someplace regionally close because we know, right, we know in retrospect, if you think back to that sort of Stockholm Hamburg chart that I showed you, we know that, um, that there's, that parallel trends wildly breaks down as you, as you get geographically far away, right? If you compare Sweden, uh, if you compare Stockholm and Hamburg, uh, uh, you're going to see, even though, even though maybe Stockholm uh, was much closer to, let's say, Florida in terms of what the public health interventions going on there were, you're going to see a lot more similarity between Stockholm and Hamburg than you are between Stockholm and Florida for, for whatever reasons, and I don't pretend to know what they are, for whatever reasons, climate, uh, network spread, whatever it is, whatever causes uh, geographic distance to result in, in different outcomes, you're going to see different things. There. So you kind of have these two desiderata, and they really, I think, in epidemics, anyway, they really fundamentally conflict, right? Because I want, at the one hand, I want to make sure um, that, right, I want to make sure uh, that my, that the members of my donor pool are not being affected by spillover effects. I want to make sure that my donor pool that I'm comparing Yana to does not include any places where the residents would be seeing the, res the people in Yana putting masks on and wearing masks themselves. But I also want to make sure that whatever region I'm looking at is geographically close enough that, right, the kind of thing that we expect from nonlinear phenomena, where there's just clumpiness in the data causing waves to appear regionally in all kinds of ways that we can't, right, hope to understand, certainly not, you know, in media array as they're happening. Um, so we, we need to be we need to be careful about that. And then, right, um, and then. Uh, Right, timing is also crucial in this. So if you go look, for example, at the Yana paper, uh, when they, 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 they sort of point out that the, you know, they ran the study at first and they didn't, find, they didn't find the effect they were looking for. And then they said, oh, well, actually it's because we didn't realize at first that um, when you have a mask mandate uh, and the government announces that the mask mandate is gonna come into place, people will start wearing the masks before the mandate occurs. So immediately now you've got you've introduced a degree of flexibility, right? In 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 right, it's not it's not it's no longer obvious exactly when this dotted line is happening, um, right? And if you have if you allow yourself um, some flexibility in in deciding um, when the dotted line when the dotted line happens, 
uh, then you really got yourself into a situation where you have a tremendous, what I would call a Duham problem, right? Duham was the guy that taught us that um, when you're trying to test the scientific hypothesis, it's a bad thing if there are too many flexible, uh, alter, you know, auxiliary hypotheses that you need to connect the data to your hypothesis. So if you have sort of too much flexibility in deciding what the actual impactful date of a mass mandate is, uh, that's going to really sort of hurt the inferential power of your study. Okay, I want to kind of wrap up here pretty quickly. So I'm going to uh, um, I'm going to skip a couple things here and just kind of uh, get to my conclusion here. Um, here's my I think my main conclusion, right? So nonlinear phenomena often create the illusions of patterns that require explanation. I think we saw this both in the case of uh, the warming hiatus in climate science, and we saw this happen sort of week after week, month after month, over the course of the pandemic, people uh, sort of trying to um, make cause, causal inference, you know, in media ray, as, as things are going on, right? As the phenomena themselves are unfolding. Um, uh, and I think that's especially sort of epistemically risky, right? When you have this, these nonlinear phenomena creating these patterns that have the illusion of requiring explanation, and you're trying to do the causal inference on the fly, right? When you don't really know what you don't you don't have the requisite. If you think about the you know the, the thing that Abadie is telling us about uh, the synthetic control method, right? He's basically warning you if you don't have a good handle on what's causing background noise and causing the zigging and zagging, you cannot use this method. Um, and you know it was I think pretty obvious uh, in retrospect at least that we just didn't have that kind of grip on. Um, what was making the various uh, features of, of the data uh, um, about, the, uh, uh, about those inferences um, be present. So we just didn't really have the opportunity to have the kind of grip on the data that Abadie's warning us there that we have to have to use these kind of causal inference methods. Um, and uh, I think you know, this, this is especially epistemically risky uh, when the decisions that are being supported by those inferences are uh, particularly high stakes, and I think that, that, that I, don't need to, I don't need to argue for the claim that uh, we made a lot of decisions over the course of the pandemic um, that, were, that were very high stakes. Okay, great. Thank you all. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, uh, Eric, for that wonderful presentation dissecting many of the plots and graphs that we've all been witnessing over the past few months and uh, puzzled over how these sort of policy decisions were uh, supposedly guided entirely by the data, but it's quite clear that, you know, the underlying complex nonlinearities make it not so simple to go from the data to um, policy decisions. And I think the point that you were making about the masking was uh, particularly um, interesting because of how the um, initially um, I had gathered that the uh, masking, um, not emphasizing masking had to do with the fact that there was a shortage of N95 masks because the public was buying them up when medical staff needed it, healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers were, um, there were shortages for them. So it's very interesting how all these kinds of external factors play in along with what the data is uh, telling us. Thank you so much for that exposition. And I'd like to open up the floor now and we've have um, several questions. Ty, did you wanna um, uh, read the first one? Yep, sorry, just unmuting here. Yep. First one, yep. So do you think we make peace with the linear system for using it to pin down conditionally sufficient causal factors and history and other social sciences to pin down necessary factors? And do we use non-linear for the prediction purpose? Uh, I'm gonna have to see if I can look at that myself. Is that a... Uh... It was up uh, higher back at the beginning. Uh, I a piece with the linear system for using it to pin down. I'll tell you what, I'll copy it and- Yeah, I think I see it here. Um, can, can, can you flush that out for me a little bit? Uh, it's Sanjeev. Uh, I'm not sure I get quite get the question. 
uh, can make peace with layer systems. So I, I'm Eric, I'm an economist yeah. training and we use linear system all the time to pin down causal factors. Uh -huh. But what you are saying is totally valid given that we live in a very, very complex world. So it seems like a non-linear system is more, more appropriate. But in order yeah. to make sense, you know, how to parse out the reality, that's complex reality. And that's where no, linear system helps us, you know, through such right. a... No, look, I mean, I, I don't doubt that, I don't doubt that, um, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be able to sort through all this data and we'll be able to learn some things. Um, but I think it's gonna, I think it's, it's gonna require, you can't, I, I take sort of the main point of the Abity paper to be, you can't do this kind of causal inference until you have a pretty good handle on what the background noise looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to do this stuff kind of on the fly, you know, in, in June, July, August, September of 2020, right? Um, when, you know, I mean, right? Um, as, you know, as pointed out, like I came back from California to Florida in June. At that point, neither California nor Florida had really had very much infection at all. Um, why? I mean, we don't, it, we don't really know. It could have been, it, you know, some people think it's because of uh, the climate. Um, you know, once, once maybe we've, we've been able, we've, we've seen the whole thing unfold, we'll be able to tease all this out and we'll be able to do the kind of inference where you, you know, are able to hold everything fixed mm -hmm. or at least convince yourself that you're using a sample where everything is relatively fixed. But, but doing this, you know, doing this in March, April, May, June, July of 2020, um, I mean, obviously we were going to do it, right? I mean, it's, I'm not, it, it was, it was sort of baked into the cake that we were going to do this. Um, but uh, it also should have been, I think, made a little bit more clear, I think, that this, this was hard. This, you know, what, we didn't know enough about what, rel what the relative peers to compare to was. We didn't know enough about what was, it just was, there was just a mess of data coming in and we were making inferences too fast. I mean, um, no, and, and, and Eric, I take your point that, you know, the the timing of your returning to Florida and the rise in hospitalization, yeah. right? I mean, I think, you know, one of the intriguing things about the pandemic has been how, you know, as you were pointing out, we were trying to find reasons before the phenomenon actualized fully. So right. for example, you know, prematurely people were coming with, with explanations and writing articles about, you know, how come Indians, for example, why were there few cases in India? And, you know, maybe it's vitamin D because it's yeah. a war, hot country, maybe this, maybe that. I mean, there was so, so many trees were felled for, you know, hypothesizing about these. And less than, you know, two months later, you know, the pandemic came roaring back in India with the variant, rendering all of those speculations completely yeah. moot. Right. I mean, there's, there's something known as the Sports Illustrated Curse. I don't know if people know what this is. And the, the idea is that if you, get your, if you get your picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you're going to go into a slump afterwards. <laughs> and, you know, the obvious explanation of that is that sports is, you know, mean reverting, right? Right. You're going to end up on the cover when you're at the end of a hot streak and you're going to mean revert. The worst thing that could happen to you in the pandemic was to be on the cover of Scientific American as like, look how well India is doing. Look how well New Mexico is doing. That was, the, that, was the, that was the Sports Illustrated curse. It was guaranteed if somebody wrote you up as a case study on how to manage the pandemic that within, you know, two months tops, you were going to be uh, <laughs> the poster child of what not to do. Right. Uh, happened, you know, we watched this happen. Uh, week after week and month after month, yeah. So um, there's a very interesting question from uh, Karl Hofer, who asks, you know, in terms of policy uh, recommendations, how to avoid causal attribution errors, and what I mean, what is the what flows from your analysis? Yeah, I, I mean, I just thought this right from the get go uh, in the pandemic, and I feel quite vindicated in my, in my belief in this early on, that we should have been, uh, we should have been listening to the risk, to the sort of conventional wisdom about, about epidemics and how to manage them. Uh, and this business of, you know, trying to figure out on the fly, 
what was working and what wasn't working uh, was not a good idea. So, I mean, I, I, I think again, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not very smart and I'm not a statistician and I'm not the one that's going to be able to do this, but I, I'm reasonably confident that, that there are smart people out there who, you know, as I say, down the road, will be able to tease apart what happened. Uh, you know, but it's going to take years. Um, and it just seemed to me, it was it seemed to me foolish to be, uh, you know, every month um, revising what guidelines were in response to inferences that were being made uh, on the fly like that. Particularly when, particularly when even, you know, even the normal, even the normal procedures of peer review, which we all know are, you know, we all know that ordinary peer review is not what, uh, is not what secures the reliability of science. Much more in-depth criticism has to take place than just two referees before we, before we, we get good science. But not even that res was in place, you know, in much of the pandemic. It was stuff being uploaded to preprint archives and uh, then making the New York Times two days later and, and right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there was this sort of, uh, this was a perfect storm of, you know, journalistic exuberance coupled with, you know, as you said, preprints mm -hmm. would come out hypothesizing stuff and, you know, not, uh, not peer reviewed uh, in detail, not corroborated with other independent analyses for cross checking, etc. And, uh, yeah, but and politics, and, and politics. I mean, everybody had everybody had convictions about the nature of the pandemic that were that were linked to to, to politics. I mean, that's why I kind of started with the, the Trump voting counties. I mean, we you know right. the, our, our, the, the you know the motorcycle rally. There were some just sort of transparently. I mean, maybe those weren't really like you know being done by rigorous scientists or anything like that. But 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 for pretty clearly, people were people were eager to hear that you know um, their their whatever their political convictions were, those were virtuous and led to, to good health outcomes. Right. Um, which I think in retrospect, you know, now it kind of looks like that seems unlikely. Um, there, um, so there's a, there's a really nice question from, from Chris Mink. Hi, Chris. Uh, hey, delighted Chris. that you are here. Um, and uh, his question is, what is the scope of your criticism of causal attribution? You've given various cautionary tales, but is your claim even stronger? that we have not, or maybe even cannot make any justified causal claims regarding differential performance due to the NPIs in the pandemic. Take the Sturgis rally as a concrete example, which was in August, 2020 and brought between 450,000 to 500,000 people from over half of all US counties to a week long event with no mitigation measures in place. Do you think it's impossible to make any causal claims regarding the role of this event? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely impossible. And and the, and, the, and the studies that that claim to do this were 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 ripped apart by smarter people than me. I mean, um, yeah, that's not no way. Uh, so again, I you know I think as I said, I, I think like eventually uh, various methods will be able to tease apart some of these things, but. Um, but I mean, yeah. but Eric, I mean, there yeah. is a role to play for super spreader events. I mean, super spreading events are are um, are, are real, right? I mean, yeah, they, they might be. They might be, but I mean, um, they might be. But uh, um, uh, okay, I mean, sure. Uh, but but being able to look, I, it's I'm not. I'm not denying that. Um, I'm not denying that when people get together uh, for a motorcycle ride, they're probably going to spread some disease. But the idea that you could tease out, uh, as as was done in some of these studies, tease out the actual you know number of cases, uh, you know, to attributable. To, I see. Right. Yeah, attribute and, and and then measure the economic damage of it and and whatever. When you know, again, I think in retrospect, I think it's reasonably clear that um, it just so happened that the Sturgis motorcycle rally happened in a part of the country that was, that was you know, due for their wave. I mean, it's not, it seems, it seems unlike, I'll put it this way, right? If you think, if you think, that, the, if you think that the Sturgis motorcycle rally caused all the cases that were, that were attributed to it, then in some sense, you have so fact to think that were it not for the Sturgis motorcycle rally, the kind of, you know, plain states uh, would have somehow 
been magically spared from COVID. I mean, that's what we, that's a fact that we're being asked to believe, right? If you actually if you if you actually think that that's that that's that's what the motorcycle rally did, then in some sense you think but for it, right? Uh, the but but in the end we we sort of know that like every state had its other than other than like a few really small outliers like Maine and Vermont and Hawaii, right? And Alaska. And, you know, every state eventually kind of got its due in some sense. Uh, so it seems implausible to me that like people were able to, uh, and, and, and then if you, if you actually look at, if you actually look at, uh, at, at what they did to try to show that, I mean, I, I could, I'll send you stuff. No. Later. no, but I mean, I was yeah. curious about, you know, there were also these cases of uh, churches where sure. people were, I mean, people were singing and it was shown that, you know, exercising your vocal cords in that fashion kind of spread the aerosols, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. so what, what do you make of those kinds of super spreading events, right? They were many too. I mean, I don't, I don't honestly think we're gonna, I honestly think we'll, we'll, we're gonna have to wait and see on a lot of this. I think a lot of those, I, th I do think a lot of that stuff was um, kind, of, kind of cobbled together pretty hastily. Mm. Priya, would you like me to take the next yeah. question? Yeah, please okay. go ahead. Yeah. We're going down the line. Uh, from a participant, I would like to know if it would be possible to understand COVID as a black swan. Is it possible to cross data from natural and social sciences? Is it not a risk in construct, uh, I think constructing artificial parallel trends? Uh, let me see if I can read that one. Is that from? A little further back. I know sometimes it's not easy to scroll through the chat feature. Here, I'll just post it again. Mm, sorry. Well, certainly, I mean, certainly it's a, it's a, it's a black swan in the sense that I, I'm, I understand the black swan is just something that nobody would have expected to have happened. Um, uh, so certainly it's a so certainly it's a black swan in that sense. Um, is it possible to cross data from natural and social science? Yeah, look, I mean, again, I think I think um, I, I I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that in the long run, as I said, we'll be able to sort through some of this. And we'll be able to disentangle what some of the natural causes were. From what are just the you know natural nonlinear variability, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, not yet. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Hey, next question begins with a favorable comment. Thanks for the fascinating talk. What evidential role do first order causal slash mechanistic explanations play in nonlinear phenomena? For instance, let's say that. Prior to doing a large scale tourist program, there was a small focus group that showed that the intervention is effective on a micro scale. Does this have any evidential value that the tourist intervention will have some efficacy when put out on a large scale? I mean, that goes case by case, right? I, I can't answer that generally, right? But I think often, um, often in the case uh, of like epidemics, What's, what's usually going on with something like that is something that's being, you know, tested uh, in a kind of, you know, um, micro clinical setting and then being extrapolated to a social setting. So, you know, you might do something like put masks on mannequins you know, in a room and have them spray aerosols out and see whether, you know, what portion of that the, of the aerosols is trapping. Um, but that doesn't tell you, you know, it doesn't tell you whether you're preventing on the, uh, an in, you know, a, a minimum infectious dose from getting to the other person. It doesn't tell you, uh, you know, it just certainly doesn't tell you anything about what mask mandates do to, in terms of mask wearing, right? Um, you could be 100% convinced that mask wearing reduces spread without believing that mask mandates do, particularly maybe if you thought that, you know, mask wearing for so I, I, you know, I, I think I think I, uh, this is right. That the sort of standard view in clinical settings uh, about N95 masks was you shouldn't go into a room with one of them hoping that it will protect you for more than 20 minutes. That was I think the usual guideline. Like go in there, wear your N95 mask, like get out within 20 minutes. 
Why? Not because N95 masks only last 20 minutes or something like that, but because people are not very good at not sticking their fingers in there after about 20 minutes. Um, what about, you know, what about people who were working eight hour shifts with a mask? Like, so, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, obviously um, you can get causal information uh, from these abstract settings, like, you know, putting ma masks on mannequins and seeing what kind of aerosols come through them or whatever, but getting from there to knowing what um, the actual impact of, let's say, you know, a mask mandate on an entire uh, municipality or county or state or whatever is going to be um, not just for one day, but for months, right? Yeah. Again, remembering that like you know, this was this was a marathon, not a sprint, right? The, uh, something that maybe protected people while they were complying perfectly for a few days might not have had value if over the course of months those mandates stopped being enforced or whatever. So um, it's, it's, I think you know there, there's a uh, there's a little bit of you can be you can glean from from things like that, but uh, I mean there's a reason why we there's a reason why, um, for example, economists uh, like to look at the difference and difference method rather than just focus groups or something like that because yeah. it's difficult to extrapolate from those contexts to broader contexts. So, but but Eric, do you, wh what do you make of the six feet in the social distancing? Do you think that was so? I, I thought that was I I thought that was well understood to have been made up and not particularly. Okay. I I so my this I you know my understanding the late the latest what we're supposed is that you know it's it's more about um it's more about a uh, number of people in the room how much time they spend in the room mm -hmm. the quality of mm -hmm. ventilation in the room uh, and not so much about uh it's not like in other words I I thought the the consensus now was not so much that I. I don't just directly transmit the virus to you. I kind of fill the room up with it. Right. Um, and uh, so the six feet, I think most people start to think it didn't matter that much. Right. Okay. Um, I'll read out the last question I think we have on the list here. Uh, what about things like surfaces versus airborne transmission, building on what you were just saying? Yeah. That the latter is more important, airborne transmission, strikes me as something most of us, myself included, feel like we've learned over the course of the pandemic and which has informed reasonable changes, of course, when it right. comes to mitigation strategies. So focusing less on cleaning, for instance, more on ventilation indoors and outdoor. Right. The concrete version of the question just asked, did we have no reason for making those changes? So, look, so I mean, those are, those, are, those are quite different, right? I mean, so I, th I take it the surface thing, like we know, like that's, pretty clear like fomites don't transmit coronavirus it's just like the washing of your groceries you know all that was for nothing right but that's but i mean that's a that's a that's a that's like you, you can ruling out a potential causal mechanism right is a lot easier i mean it's not it's not easy it still wasn't it still took us a few months i take it or whatever but that right and 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 and, and separating um at separating right whether again six feet versus filling up a room thing i mean those are things that you can those are things that you can determine in a microscopic context right those are things those are sort of basic mechanical facts that you can i think determine in a microscopic context but that's quite different from you know you can make you can make guesses from facts like that to what interventions are going to do socially but social interventions are unbelievably complicated right i mean this was, again, this was something that was like, this was something that I think, you know, was widely known and understood among public health experts prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, that closing schools for more than six weeks is ineffective. Why? Not because, not because of any, not because of anything you could learn by watching what happens with kids in school and the way the virus is, no, because the, Kids are kids and they crave social interaction. And if you close the schools, they eventually start congregating in other ways. So, it, you know, I, I like to remind people that the deem and epidemiology is from the Greek word for people. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, the things that we're talking about here are not just, you know, microscopic facts about how the virus is transmitted. We're talking about like what happens when you institute public health measures 
and you then have to wait and see like what people are going to do, right? That's very different than being able to predict what will happen if people actually do exactly what you say. Right. 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 Which never happens. People don't do exactly what you say. Never. That's just, you know, that's not yeah. how, that's not, that's not how policy making works. You don't, when you're evaluating a, a, a policy intervention, you don't just imagine that everyone's going to do exactly what you tell them to do because it doesn't go that way. Right. Um, so I guess there's That's one the final, yeah, one final question has come in. And, and uh, the question is that it's been usual to miss cultural issues when news, news presents data on how to think about cultural traditions that make for difficult comparisons. How does one take that into account? Do we need observations from other fields like ethnography? Yeah, this was another thing I think that set me off uh, early on in the pandemic uh, about this kind of stuff. So we started seeing, I was in California early and we started seeing early on in California that like um, Latino communities were having uh, more infection than non-Latino communities. I started seeing people talk about, oh, it's because you know, fill in the blank about how Latino people behave. And I just thought, oh, no, it's because these people, I, I, my guess, my wild guess is it's because these people have jobs that don't allow them to work over Zoom. Right, um, exactly. And let's not, you know, let's not leap to like stereotypes about how various ethnic groups like comport themselves. Uh, mm. and, and so that was, you know, uh, one thing that I think set me off kind of early about like, let's not be super hasty in making these causal attributions. But, but on the other hand, I mean, it is undeniable that communities of color were hit much, much harder, both economically, epidemiologically, and, and in terms of, we already knew that the care, medical care um, for these communities is not as robust as it is for- Absolutely, look, I mean, so, I mean, uh, this was, I remember seeing this, uh, uh, I think maybe Ad Hiller who asked a question and maybe pointed this out to me, somebody did early on, that the, 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 uh, the number of beds per capita, hospital beds per capita in Manhattan was like three or four times higher than in Queens. Right. And lo and behold, like they were bad, you know, that, where, where were the hospitals in New York overwhelmed right. uh, in Queens? Uh, and of course also, right, I mean, you know, the policy... Look, I mean, the policy, these policy interventions were being made by, uh, you know, wealthy white people. Um, and so they were, you know, a lot of them were designed to protect us. Uh, we, we were the ones deciding what were essential services and what weren't essential services, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and then, you know, of course, also uh, in the U.S., particularly among, you know, particularly among African Americans, obviously, we we unfortunately have kind of pre-existing, um, you know, uh, bad bad health. That's you know, obviously, the result of various other racial inequalities, et cetera. So there's a whole complex mixture in there. But 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 I but I but I really doubt. I mean, I I have. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say it, I doubt. I should just say it'd be on my back burner, right? To think that what's going on there is something like, oh, it's because, you know, it's because Latino people behave this way or it's because black people behave that way or whatever. Like, let's leave that for last. Right. Like, yeah. And curiously, that seems to be where people go first. Yeah, of course, of course it is. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So um, if there are no further questions, Ty, do you see any? I think we- I think we got them all, I think. So um, thank you so much, Eric, for this wonderful wow. talk. And um, we really look forward to uh, the discussion tomorrow. It's gonna be great. I've talked to yeah. Daphne a bit about which, it's gonna be, it's gonna shift gears to a much more sort of broad spectrum look at things. So people, I think people don't wanna miss it. I think Stephanie's stuff's gonna be Super interesting tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you everyone for attending. And Stephanie, we're really looking forward to um, the discussion tomorrow. Thanks everyone and see you thank at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Yeah.